And this Sunday is the Sunday of the Holy Trinity, so therefore we will confess the Athanasian Creed, which is one of our three ecumenical creeds. And those are important creeds for all Christians to know about, to confess. Although I would say, at least dominantly in America, very few Christians have good acquaintance with the three creeds, right? Um, and uh, they're just important because they're part of church history. They come from the first four centuries. They came out of Christological and Trinitarian controversies, doctrinal issues in the church. So they're extremely important. And as you know, three of the 10 documents in the Book of Concord, the Lutheran Confessions, three of them are the creeds, which is our assertion that we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church and therefore, the Athanasian Creed says this is the Catholic faith. And uh, so we again understand what the church's marks are as one holy Catholic and apostolic church, that these are universal creeds confessed before the world as a statement of our Christian faith. So it's very good that we do that. And uh, so as we gather, once again, a reminder, stay six feet apart. Did you bring your pool noodle? Your pool noodles are six feet. All right, nobody brought their pool noodle, okay? Um, that's, that's all we're asking, basically, is this, stay six feet apart, okay? So when you go into church, you're not going to be able to sit in your favorite pew. I hate to tell you that. You can't sit in your favorite pew. You might be able to, but I don't know. There's a 50-50 chance you can't, right? Okay. If you, when you go in, go to the middle of your pew. Don't sit on the end. Go to the middle. Because we had an issue last week. The problem is we need people to go to the middle. We don't have enough space. If people sit on the ends, then people have to walk by you. Only sit on the end if you need Holy Communion served in your pew. Otherwise, go to the middle and, and spread out. That's the other thing. If you normally sit on the right side in church, sit on the left side. If you normally sit in the back, sit in the front. If you normally sit in the front, spread out. The whole idea is to spread out six feet apart. Okay? And to minimize contact. That's all, that's all we're doing here. Communion will be continuous again. I think it went pretty well. So we'll just do it in that manner. Does that, anybody have any questions about anything? I know we got stacked up in the narthex last week because you wanted to visit. No visiting, no socializing in church, okay? If you want to socialize, come over here. We can spread out, seriously. Come over to the hall afterwards. You can stay afterwards, spread out here. We got chairs six feet apart here. That's fine. But no visiting in the narthex. When you go in this morning, just pick up your bulletin and sit down. There won't be anybody in there to talk to you anyway. And when you leave, don't visit in the narthex. Uh, I think last Sunday we had a lot of people socializing. Just leave right away. Well, we carry a protester sign. It's okay if we all get together. <laughs> what are you protesting? The Pope? Martin Luther was a protestant. Yeah. <laughs> so. And when we, uh, we dismiss you will be dismissed from the back. The usher will dismiss the back yeah, row first. So stay seated. Don't get up and leave until the usher directs you. Just follow the direction of the usher. Yeah. Okay? That's all. It's, it's pretty simple. simple. Yeah. All right. So whatever you've been doing the last 80 or 90 years, just forget about it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Your habits have to change a little bit. That's all. Okay? The offering plates are in the narthex. So what, what can I say? What can I say? Okay? I just go with the flow. I don't know anything about this. They tell me there's a virus out there. I haven't seen it yet. I, I don't know what to believe anymore, honestly. No. So um, I don't pay attention to a lot of it. Um, I think what we need to do is to devote ourselves to God's word, which is unchanging, which is certain, brings us joy and hope, and we'll adapt as we go on uh, with this. So I was glad everybody came back for the most part last Sunday. I think there were 52 in attendance or thereabouts. And I pray that more will come uh, today. We can have 25% of capacity, which is about 80 people. That's our capacity. So it'd be a wonderful problem to have if we exceeded the capacity. Uh, any questions? Any comments? Okay. We're good, huh? So um, my prediction is we need a new story. So next week I'm praying for a hurricane. If you could pray for a hurricane, it'd be a great distraction. And we need a forest fire, too. So if we pray for a forest fire, um, COVID is over, riots are over, protests are just about over. So I think a hurricane is in order, and then a forest fire. Um, 
and, and you know, other catastrophes that we are told about in the scriptures. So let us begin with prayer on this Sunday of the Holy Trinity and ask for God's blessing upon the word. Blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And there is a quick thought on this too. You know, if people ask the question, what would Jesus do? Well, that's not the question. The question is, what has Jesus done? That's the important question. So how did Jesus deal with catastrophes and things of this nature? Well, he dealt with them in faith towards his father. And that's the important point for all of us. But he also, when Jesus dealt with anything, he had one word that he liked to use. And it's a very biblical word. What do you think that word is? The R word. Repent. Yeah. So... You will find this, how Jesus dealt with catastrophes is one of my favorite passages in Luke 13, when they told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So apparently Pilate slaughtered some Galileans, no doubt. Um, and uh, Jesus answered and said to them, do you suppose these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Now, then he brought up the Tower of Siloam. They didn't bring this up, but in Luke 13, he brought it up, and he said, this tower fell and killed them. Do you think they were worse sinners? What's the answer? No. no, the answer is no. I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So Jesus is always turning everything around when we're trying to figure things out in life and saying, you need to repent. Who needs to repent? You need to repent. I need to repent, okay? So when we look at this biblically, we would not use a phrase like black lives matter. I wouldn't even say white lives matter. I would say all lives matter. That's biblical, right? From conception to grave, all lives matter to God. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. All people matter to Jesus Christ, right? Every single soul matters to him. He died for all. And so we're bringing this message to all. And the other day I thought about the church. Our, our purpose as a church is not to change the world, not to bring in a new world order, right? Not to set up a theocracy. John Calvin tried that. Right? Our goal is to do what? To preach the gospel and administer the sacraments for salvation. That's why we are here. So we will not be deterred by the world. We're not going to buy into the world. Christians buy into the world way too much, okay? And so we're not going to buy into the world. We're going to be faithful. We're going to love our neighbor. Uh, even when our neighbor may disagree with us or we have different political views, whatever it is, we're still going to love our neighbor. We're going to speak the truth in love, as the book of Ephesians tells us to do. And we're going to stay devoted to what God wants us to devote ourselves to. Because if we don't, then we've gone the way of the world. And, and the world, as you know, what can it do to you? The world can only destroy you. You know that? The world can't offer you anything, can it? What can the world offer you? Well, you've been enticed, right? And you thought the world could offer you something, but what did it give you? The answer is nothing, right? Disappointment. <laughs> yeah, disappointment, yeah. And you thought it was good. So our Lord, um, you know, really helps us focus on this in Mark 6.30. I'd like to pick up on this, of the apostles. And by the way, I, I kind of skirted over the, the, the recount here where you have, um, you know, Jesus going out and doing these things, and Herod gets... Uh, what shall we say, insecure, as it were, thinking that he's heard about Jesus, and who does he think he is? He thinks he's John the Baptist, risen from the dead, which is, that, that's remarkable. It can show you what your mind can do, how delusional he is. But the reason you have that account in there, where he's, he's kind of rehashing what had happened earlier with John, the beheading and all, is because of the, um, the opposition to Jesus and the fame of Jesus being spread throughout the, the uh, region there because of what he did. But what you're going to see here is you have the rejection at Nazareth in chapter 6, where Jesus is rejected by his own family. So we learn about familial rejection and family members not aligning themselves with Christianity. 
And that occurs in every family, by the way. It occurs in yours and mine. It occurs all over the place. You have family members. It might be a wife or husband who rejects Christianity, who rejects the Lord, rejects the church. And you will see that rejection firsthand. You could all tell your story, could you not? Right? Okay. So we're learning that here, the rejection from family, but then you learn about the rejection from, it's really interesting, from the world, from the government, because Herod had John beheaded because he called him on his adultery and wanted him to repent. So what's the world going to do to Christians today? If we as Christians say we need to repent, turn back to God, you know what the world's going to say? Me, right? That'd be nice if they just did that, okay? Yeah. Um, so um, that's just the way the world goes. Uh, so I already had, <laughs> I told the elders it's going to happen. I already had one veiled threat because of our reopening of the services, okay? It's already occurred, okay? Anonymous, a veiled threat, as it were, okay? Mm -hmm. Regarding the opening of our services, and the word is out. And I told the elders this, expect this. It's going to happen, right? Okay. I don't, have you had any? No? Okay, that's interesting. I would expect that our members would be getting threats from their family members, right? Or criticism. Nope. Have any of you received this? Or they're all happy that it's happened. Oh, so it just, it's interesting, but I told people this too. Don't, don't think that your own family members might not be critical of you like you're an imbecile going back to church, right? Why are you going back to church? The criticism, okay? Well, family members might criticize that anyway, even on a good day, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> we're, we're lucky. Okay, well, that's good. That's interesting. But my point is, you know, it, 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 we know what the world thinks, what the world will do. Jesus gets the opposition from family. He gets it from government, right? Okay, so, you know, we can expect this, too, from leaders who are going to oppose Christianity. He got it from... Uh, Herod here, in this case of John, who was beheaded because he called him to repent. And then they deal with, um, the, the, the disciples come and they hear of this and take away his corpse in verse 29 and laid it in a tomb. So they have this reverent kind of acquiescence and saying, okay, you know, we're not going to start a rebellion. They didn't, Christians didn't have rebellions, did they? They didn't do that kind of thing. They prayed for their leaders, uh, they supported them, but they could not compromise the truth. So we're in the same way today. We're not going to start a rebellion. You're not going to change the United States of America. You know that? No, that's true. And that's not your goal to change the United States of America. Your goal is to let the Holy Spirit change you through the power of the gospel and sacraments, and then you will be light and salt uh, to the world. But in the meantime, you will suffer for it, and you may have to die for it too, right? You may have to die for it, okay? Your, your church might have to take a stand and be criticized for it, and, and these kind of things are going to happen. So you have that opposition. All right, now what happens in verse 30, he gathers his apostles together and, and told him all the things, both what they had done and what they had taught. So what you have is this opposition, and this is kind of the way the church is, too, you think about this. We go out into the world, we get all this stuff, the opposition. We come back together, right? We come together to meet Jesus. Why did you come back to church last Sunday? Why did you come back to church today? There's, there's one person who wants to see you. You know what his name is? Jesus, Jesus Christ, right? And, and he is present. That's if somebody says, why, why do you go to church? Because I want to meet Jesus Christ. Actually, he wants to meet me, right? He invites me because Jesus invites me to come. And he invites me to come because when I come into the presence of Jesus, into the presence of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I won't distinguish that, today's Holy Trinity, but what does God do? We're going to read from Genesis today. You know what God does? He creates and he gives. The Holy Spirit is the Lord and the giver of life. Jesus does what? Gives you salvation. And somebody uttered the word gifts, and it's always important. Because everything that comes from God is a gift, is it not? Think of the three articles of the creed. Where'd your body come from? Gift of God. Your intellect. Your failing intellect. <laughs> Whatever it is, okay? Well, it's, again, it ties to sin. You think about that, okay? And then you think about the Father who's given us this wonderful gift of life, the Creator who's given us all the blessings of this life, um, by the way, I tell Christians this too, don't, get, don't forget to enjoy life, right? 
And I told you during this pandemic, too, is there anything wrong with laughing, with joking, with having enjoyment? You know, uh, don't be doom and gloom about things either. That's, that's something that we can be very susceptible to, I think, right? I mean, if you, quite frankly, the, the events of the last whatever, you know, months, year, whatever thing, it, you have to admit this now, too. If you want to argue with me, it's fine. But don't you think it gets to you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Don't you think it gets to you? And after a while, you go, what a fool. Why didn't I turn that switch off before? You know, uh, that type of thing. So you, you come to Jesus, you take your enjoyment, you sing his praise, you rejoice in this, and you receive his gifts. Because when he gives you gifts, you are delighted. You give thanks to God. And I think we should never lose that joy that we have in Christ. That's why we come to church, to receive his gifts. So if somebody asks you, well, why are you going to church? I wouldn't go to church, you know. Well, because I need the gifts of Jesus. I need what he gives me, forgiveness of sins, eternal life, and salvation. I can't get that anywhere else, right? I can't get that anywhere else. So there, there's a benefit. They come together. And, and by the way, I think that we're going to learn some lessons about this coming together, too, and how valuable it is. Maybe we knew this already. But, you know, streaming, don't get me going on streaming sacraments, okay? Um, that's not scriptural. It's not confessional. I know LCMS churches and pastors are doing it, but it's not biblical, okay? You can't stream the sacraments, the Holy Communion. It says here that the apostles gathered to Jesus. So it's implicit in all Old Testament, New Testament, that Christians do what? They come together, not on the Internet, now, again, I'm not being critical of an AM, FM radio broadcast going out for a little old lady who's in a nursing home who can't listen to Redeemer's sermons in person. That's not what I'm talking about, okay? What I'm talking about here is what the biblical mandate is in Ephesians, excuse me, Hebrews, where it says, let us not neglect the assembling of ourselves. And so... When, when all of this went down to just the personal aside, many pastors were kind of anguishing over this whole thing too. Well, who do I obey now? You know, which commandment do I follow? Third commandment says what? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And Gov Newsom says what? You can't go to church. So do I bow the knee to Governor Newsom or do I bow the knee to Jesus? Well, I had an answer to all that, okay? You know what my answer was? You follow both commandments. And it's not a compromise, but somebody asked me, I said, well, honestly, our church never shut down. That's the truth. I was here every Sunday morning. I, we never shut down, okay? And people, people showed up that first Sunday, and I knew it. I knew people would not get the word. And guess what? Several parishioners came. And when they came, guess what happened? We had church. When I, you think I'd send them away empty-handed? No, I set up, I just, I didn't have the communion set up. I was the altar guild for 10 weeks, whatever it was. No, it's fine. Okay. By the way, I made it very simple. I only put the chalice up there, okay? which was fine. Everybody took the chalice and they lived. You know, we're good. Um, so I think we're good. We might have to close those doors. I think the flies are coming in here. If you wouldn't mind, yeah. No contact doors. <laughs> yeah. But anyways, um, my my point being, a lot of pastors were in this quandary, and and so when it first went down on March 19th, when Governor Newsom said, you know, stay at home order. I prayed about that thought, and I, but I still had this in the back of my mind. It took me a few weeks to work through this. I actually prayed to God. I said, God, for, have mercy on me because I feel like I'm bowing the knee to Caesar. And if I am, that's a sin. Thank you. That is a sin to bow the knee to Caesar and not to Jesus. It, but I was also understanding that I'm a citizen, and if our government believes something is good for the common good and the common health, then I will obey an emergency order then too. But I think what happened with that, my resolution of it, and I did have some moments of anguish there too. I had some parishioners, uh, one parishioner told me, I, I can't believe you just caved in and shut the church down, Pastor. Yeah. Um, and I said, well, I can believe it because I did it. <laughs> you know? But I didn't make light of it. But my whole point was, a lot of pastors were going back and forth on this. So I, here's the point. You can follow these commandments. You can be a good neighbor. Uh, you can protect your neighbor. And you can be faithful to God all at the same time. And I think that's what 
how it came down in a lot of churches, but in a lot of churches it didn't. Some just shut down completely. I knew pastors that didn't make any homebound calls. They didn't leave their houses. They stayed locked up. Oh, it's a stay-at-home order. I said, what about your parishioners that have need of these things? You know, that type of thing. So uh, we go through these things, and it, we're always going to have these challenges to, you know, how we're going to deal with this. I wasn't alive in 1918, and neither were any of you. Blanche, you were born in 20, so you were close, all right? Uh, do the math on Blanche. That's right, 100 <laughs> in September. But my point is, none of us lived through 18 and the Spanish flu. But the churches did close. Read the history on that. The LCMS churches did close. That was a bad one. 600,000 Americans died. One third of the world's population was wiped out. Okay? None of us here lived through that. So I read of a lady who is 107 who got the Spanish flu when she was six. And she got the latest virus also and was told, her family was told she had 12 hours to live. And the next day she went home. Hmm. And she's fine now. So I know one elderly person. I know one elderly person in their 80s who really wants to go home to be with the Lord and doesn't, didn't understand why um, he was not getting any visitors, okay? He's in a care home. And that's, that's bad, by the way. They're still locked down, you know that? Can't get into care homes. And, and the family was trying to explain to him what this coronavirus was and why people can't come in and visit him. And his, his, his comment, his question was, how can I get that disease? <laughs> he wanted to get it. Yeah, that was his supposition. He says, I would like to get that disease. Yeah. <laughs> so at any rate, his, his point was, and you know what, you think about this, it, it's reminiscent of Philippians 121, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain, right? You sometimes, you, you get to a certain point in life, and I can see this if you're elderly, you're getting near the end of your life, that you just pray that God would take you and you would be with the Lord in heaven. Because you want to leave this veil of tears, as Luther refers to it in the Catechism. You want to be with Christ, and you can begin to understand that a little bit too. Which is why, in many cases, um, the, the people that are, you know, it's funny, but it, it goes back and forth. But a lot of elderly people really didn't care about this pandemic because it didn't matter to them. It was like pick your poison, you know, basically, okay? They didn't understand it. They, they've lived through a lot, lived through polio, Great Depression, wars, things like this, you know, so not that big of a thing. But what Jesus does, back to this, because I'm getting aside here, is he brings them together and they told him what they had done and what they had taught. And again, you see twofold action. You see action of the disciples, which would have been what? Healing, casting out demons, raising the dead. There were certain actions that took place. We call these uh, deeds, we call them uh, miracles. They are sign gifts. We could put them as sign gifts of the Lord. Because again, this power was a gift from Christ that he bestowed on them. And then also, they, that's, that was number one. They gave a report. It was like an evaluation. And number two, it was what? What they taught. I'm just going to put teaching here. Or uh, doctrine. Because they were purveyors of Christian doctrine. And we can never forget that as well. They weren't just going out, hey, do you believe in Jesus? They were teaching the whole counsel of God. Because what they taught, see, we only know what we have in Scripture. But how much more were they taught by Jesus? Much, much more. So they would have taught about what? About sin, about grace, mm -hmm. salvation, repentance, and things like this. So then Jesus says to them, come aside um, by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. Well, that's interesting. Do you and I need rest? Yes. Isn't it nice to come to church and not have the television blaring? And here I am talking about this stuff. God forgive me. <laughs> You don't want to hear about this, seriously, okay? It's all right to discuss it in the context of Scripture. I don't mind that, okay? But it, it certainly should not be the sum and substance of what we're teaching and promulgating here. Isn't it nice to come to church and to just shut off the laptop and the computer and the Twitter and the Facebook and all of that? And we come aside to a deserted place and we rest a while. And that's an indication of Sabbath, which means that we, we need this break. We need to come every seven days, do we not? We need this. Last Sunday, I realized how much I needed it, more than ever. And it was just a joyous thing. There was a lot of emotion in last Sunday's divine service, as you could tell. Some of you felt it. I felt it. There was a lot of joy and gladness. 
at the same time kind of thinking, well, this is a little bit different, but it's okay, right? It's just a little bit different, but it's still okay. You know why? Um, liturgy, hymns, body and blood, confession, absolution, organ. It wasn't that much different, was it? But it was a way to come aside and rest and even the, the matter of a building, you know, a deserted place. Now, I know buildings are not the church, but there is a place that uh, insulates us from the world. And when you look through the windows of Redeemer, you don't see the world, do you? Amen. You see Christ through those icons, as it were. You're looking at the windows into heaven, you know, uh, looking at the crucifix, a beautiful sight. We preach Christ crucified. To hear the music that is not worldly music, it's church music. To sing the hymns. And, and that refreshes us. It does a lot of good. And that's our deserted place. And Jesus knew we need this. They needed it as well. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. What does that tell you? It was a rat race. And life can be like that. So there was too much commotion. So what he did was he said, let's depart. And they go to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. He had a secluded place on the Sea of Galilee. And that's where the Lord took them. All right. Now, the problem is here. Look at this. The multitudes saw them departing and many knew him and ran there on foot from all sides. He was popular. He couldn't get away from it. And that's interesting to me that while Jesus was trying to retreat, he really couldn't do it. There, there was a certain popularity of Jesus. Don't think that they were all opposed to him. Who were the people that followed him and, and supported him, prayed for him? The people who had benefited from his ministry, right? The people that had received these gifts and, and the people that received the teaching was, were the ones that followed him. And it says they arrived before them and came together to him. So as they went out and, and they went to this place for instruction and prayer... Uh, Jesus um, understood this, and he saw these crowds. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude. And what he, happened here was he was moved with compassion. In other words, he had like bowels of compassion. He had this empathy for them. What, for what reason? Because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. Sheep need a shepherd. What was their lack of a shepherd? They didn't have any spiritual leaders who could guide them correctly. They needed a true shepherd. They were like sheep not having a shepherd. And I think the analogy was the Pharisees and Sadducees were kind of like their shepherds, but they were false shepherds. They were false teachers. They were apostates. And our compassion today should be that the church would have a faithful shepherd leading the flock. So who is the good shepherd? The good shepherd's Jesus, John chapter 10, right? Mm -hmm. I am the good shepherd. And that's a common theme throughout. Psalm 23 says, the Lord Yahweh is my shepherd. So you have sheep who are vulnerable to predators. You're vulnerable. Don't, don't think yourself a strong person, by the way, okay? If you do, that's a mistake. And don't ever say of another Christian, well, so-and-so is a strong Christian. That's not biblical, and it's not, it's not fair. That's, I don't like to use that word. Well, it's not good for that other person if you put that on them. Because then they feel they have something to live up to, right? And that person doesn't believe that anyway, you know that? <laughs> you ever talk to strong Christians? They will humbly tell you their strength is only in the Lord. They have nothing in and of themselves, okay? Uh, you don't have anything superhuman, super spiritual within you. You have nothing. All you have is the flesh, Sin, right? And that's all it is. But Jesus had this compassion for them, which is an interesting thing, this empathy. And so he began to teach them many things. If you're compassionate to somebody, you know what you do? You teach them the truth, right? He told them the truth about themselves, about sin and grace. And that's an interesting thing. So when we, when we want to be empathetic, when we want to be kind, we have to realize as Christians, the number one thing is, to promulgate the truth, even if it might be upsetting, correct? We have to stay with the truth. So in the Lutheran church, one of those truths is right in our confession and absolution, is it not? When we confess our sins. We're not pretending to be special people or better than everybody else. We simply confess that before the, the Lord and one another. So he teaches them because, now this is the thing, what does the church need today? It needs this, exactly the same thing, it needs teaching, right? So I think about this in 
Um, if you go on, there's a connection here. I'm going to read ahead and then come back to this. I'm going to circle back. He teaches them the day is spent, and it says the disciples thought this was a deserted place, and the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. Then what happens is he launches into this feeding, which is very interesting. And I can't help but think, if you look at this, this is almost like the liturgy, is it not? This is like a liturgy taking place. What's the first part of the service? The service of the word. Okay? The serv it's called the service of the word when you look at that. And why do we have a service of the word? Because we need teaching. We need that biblical teaching. This morning is... Today's the Feast of the Holy Trinity, so we're going to read from Genesis. And, and you read that, and I want you to pay attention to that. Why would the, the lectionary have Genesis 1 and 2 as the lectionary for Holy Trinity? Because it talks about the Father, Son, and the The plural. Spirit. Let us Father, make Father. God in our image. The Spirit hovered over the face of the waters. That tie into John 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. By Him all things were made. And so you see the Holy Trinity right in Genesis 1 very fascinating to me so and you look at that I'm not going to steal a thunder from the sermon but you look at this and you go well wait a second you know um, it was interesting because I was thinking about Joel Osteen the other day does anybody have a familiarity with Joel Osteen who's a television preacher why are you laughing over here <laughs> so how do I not know so I had the other day this is interesting okay I want to tell you this okay as a pastor I'm going to share with you some things here too um Sometimes, Lutheran satire is great. You ever yeah. watch Lutheran satire? Okay. It kind of pokes fun at other things, okay? It's on YouTube. Um, I, I've, I've been criticized before, and I know a lot of my fellow confessional pastors can, have been criticized on this too, that sometimes we mock or we make fun of other uh, preachers or denominations. Like, okay, like Joel Osteen, for example. You start chuckling. See, you were laughing at him. You were kind of mocking him, right? That type of He's thing. not a serious person. So... Um, if you follow Joel Osteen, look at him, and I don't know, some of you might follow him and think he's great, you know, but uh, Ravi Zacharias, I've just been interesting in Ravi Zacharias after his death a month or so ago, and he was a noted Christian apologist. He did a little assessment on Joel Osteen and said, Joel Osteen is not a preacher of the gospel. Well, I knew that, right? He does not preach the gospel. That's very clear. What he said was, he's a Christian motivational speaker, is what he is. Right? That's kind of a fair, not even, well, he's a Christian. He purports to be a Christian, confesses Christ, okay? But he doesn't preach that, okay? He's a motivational speaker. And, and Zacharias said, basically, I've listened to his sermons, and he never preaches the cross. He never preaches the cross. Glory. Well, there was a big one when I grew up. How many of you were raised in Southern California? Garden Grove. Hmm. Crystal Cathedral. Hour of power. The Hour of Power. Robert Schuller, right? How many of you watched Robert Schuller on Sunday nights at whatever he was on, okay? It's before 60 Minutes or after 60 Minutes. And, and I remember, you know, he was very popular in Southern California, right? Garden Grove, the Crystal Cathedral. Many LCMS Lutherans thought he was great, you know, wonderful. I mean, you know, he'd bring uh, all these guests on. He had a beautiful Rufati pipe organ. Diane Bish played that organ. The place is beautiful. How many of you have been in the Crystal Cathedral? You know what it is today? It's a Roman Catholic cathedral for the archdiocese, and it has a crucifix at the altar. And I thought to myself, what an irony. In many ways, as much as I dispute Roman Catholic teachings, it's more Christian, perhaps more Christ-centered now than it was when Schuler was there. But we analyzed Schuler's sermons in seminary, and I came to, well, he was a protege of Norman Vincent Peale, so what does that tell you, okay? The power of positive thinking. And he didn't preach the cross either. He never used the word sin. He never used the word repent. So be very discerning when you listen to the teachings in the church, to the doctrine, and test it with scripture. And what Jesus did was he taught them these things, but then he couples this with the feeding. Now, what, what is my point here? You have teaching, and what's the second part of the divine service? The meal, right? The Lord's Supper, which is central to us. And this... This was very interesting, too, in this pandemic. It was very fascinating to me. I have served Holy Communion so many times in the last three months, I can't even count. Literally, people were coming every day of the week. Many of them just dropping in, because I let it be known, 
it was by a point, but, but you know what? It's, it's kind of like directions and floor markings. Some people follow it and some people don't. That's fine, okay? That's, that's fine. Honestly, I don't think it's a bad thing. I, I wish we would do more of this. I, I, it's fine with me. People come by the church, they just drop in. Why? They just want to talk. Fine, right? Amen. People ask me, you got office hours? Yes. 24 hours a day, six days a week. Seriously, right? Why would you office hours for your pastor? What does that mean? I don't do office hours for two reasons. Number one, it constricts people on when they can talk to their pastor. The only thing people respect is my day off on Monday. I understand that. But if it's life and death, you know you can call me, and some of you have. Life and death is life and death. You set everything aside, okay? Let's take another Monday, no problem. But the other thing with office hours, I'll disappoint you, and some pastors do this, because what if I have a hospital call or something emergent, and I can't be there for the office hours? Well, I came by, and you didn't keep your office hours, that type of thing. What I'm getting at here is in this whole thing of people having a need for what the church gives them, right? that only Christ can give them, and they receive it from Jesus. So Jesus turns around in verse 37 and says, you give them something to eat. Now, you've got to like Jesus. He's a little bit snarky sometimes, isn't he? But why is he doing these things, asking questions or making comments? Because it's impossible, right? They can't give these people enough to eat. These guys are working for minimum wage at best, right? These aren't wealthy men, right? This is not Warren Buffett following Jesus, going to turn some shares of Berkshire Hathaway, right? <laughs> Who are these guys? Fishermen, tax collectors, ordinary men. They don't have the resources because they've been traveling light, right? What did he tell them? Don't even take a money bag, you know, travel light. They don't, it's, and Jesus says, you give them something to eat. It, it, but the point is, what? what? Can they do this? And they answer him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? So they come back, okay, and they understand. This would have been a, basically a half a year's salary. So you take your half a year's salary, your pension, your social security, and think that's an exorbitant sum of money, and that's how much it would take. They don't have the resources to do this. And that's exactly the point, right? We don't have the resources. But he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, five loaves and two fish. All right. <laughs> Not enough, is it? Now, why five and two? Seven. Seven. Biblical number, completeness, fullness. Okay? Why bread and fish? I know it doesn't tie totally to the Lord's Supper, but I think about it. There's two elements here, aren't there? Okay. This would have been great if they said you have bread and wine. They all would come running. <laughs> but no, it, it's not that. Well, these are the two elements here. And I'm not going to read a lot into that. What he did was he commanded them to sit and down in groups on the green grass, which talks about the orderliness of this too. And I think there's something to this. This wasn't just, you know, order in the church. And Structure Bob is leaving right now, unfortunately. You know? But, you know, uh, Structure Bob, it talks about order. And we talk about order in the church. 1 Corinthians 14, 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. That's the point. What God does is always orderly, is it not? And he sits them down in the service, as it were, in order, in ranks, in hundreds and in fifties, for the purpose of distribution. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves. Now this becomes very Eucharistic, doesn't it? This becomes very Eucharistic. This is almost like the words of institution. It's prefiguring them, right? Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, right? Which in other words, looking up and praying. So when our pastor takes the bread and the wine on the altar and consecrates it, blesses it, whatever word you want to use there, the verb, he is looking up, he's, he's speaking the words but he's speaking the words in the presence of all, giving thanks for it. And he looked up to heaven to indicate the blessing would come from the Father. There's a blessing that comes. And he broke the loaves in order to distribute it, gave it to his disciples to set before them, and the two fish he divided among them all. So you have the disciples involved in this distribution, which means that our pastors are going to be the ones to administer Holy Communion, which is why I've said, I'll say it, I'll go back to this again. You, you will know of instances where LCMS churches have done cyber communion, right? And they're in our district. There's several. I think they're still doing this, actually. 
And so when you look at that, you realize, no, that's not how Christ instituted that. You can't do that at a distance. You do this in person. And, and there were, there's ways to do it, of course, too. I think actually some churches now finally are, you know, not, not all the churches are open. You know that? No, some of them are still holding back, you know. Uh, this is my assessment, and Jerry O'Lennon kind of confirmed this. The more liberal churches have been re very reticent to open up again. The more conservative churches have been more eager to open. That's kind of a generalization. I've seen this, okay? And there's some reasons that go into that a lot, too, okay? Um, there's, there's all kinds of reasons. Some of them are theological. Some of them are actually political, too, okay? Um, and forgive me if I tell you this, but two Sundays ago... Um, it wasn't last Sunday, it was the Sunday before when we still officially weren't open. One of our members came, and this person does not receive the notifications, not on email. And, and this person came, and I said, it's really good to see you. And the person said, well, President Trump said the churches are open. It was that Sunday prior to last Sunday, two weeks ago, when President Trump said the churches should be open. So I'm going to send President Trump a note on behalf of our evangelism committee. And say, so you're a good evangelist for the Christian churches. And our member heard that, saw that on the TV, and said, I'm going to church. There you go, okay? I said, well, President Trump is right. I said, actually, our churches have never been closed, right? Okay? So we do that. We come, and, and what the Lord does is he divides this all, and he gives it to them, among them all, which, <laughs> it was amazing, 5,000 men. And they all ate and were filled. This was a miracle. What about the Lord's Supper this morning? It looks like bread. It looks like wine. It's a miracle. Now, yes, it is bread. It is wine. I don't believe in transubstantiation as Rome does, okay? Rome believes in... I love spelling this one, okay? <laughs> okay. Transubstantiation. It's a great word. You can say, well, I went to Bible class and I can't even hardly pronounce it. Transubstantiation. There we go. Did I spell it correctly? <clears throat> that looks right. It looks right. We'll stick with that. Transubstantiation. Spell it and then <coughs> repeat it and spell it again in spelling bee. I read somewhere they were canceling spelling bees now, too. Can, can you use it in a sentence? Transubstantiation <laughs> is the official Roman Catholic dogma of the Lord's <laughs> Supper as a means of explaining in a philosophical manner how bread and wine can be the body and blood of Jesus as promulgated by the Council of Trent. I'll stop there, okay? No. <laughs> This is the Roman Catholic doctrine, transubstantiation, which means trans meaning a movement of the bread and the wine. There's a change, right, of the substance. So a Roman Catholic <clears throat> believes that they eat the body and drink the blood of Jesus. That sounds very Lutheran, doesn't it? Sounds very Christian. Sounds very scriptural. Hang on. A Roman Catholic does not believe that bread and wine are present any longer because the bread and wine have changed. There's been a change or a movement in the substance. Okay? And th this is their philosophical way of trying to explain what happens. All right. The Reformed, on the other hand, Reformed churches believe it's totally symbolic. Right? It's a symbol. How many of you came out of Reformed churches? Yeah. So, you know, they, they teach it's a memorial. It's, it's bread and probably grape juice. Okay? And so they look at it as just a symbol of his body and blood or a memorial. And, and the Christian view, the Christian view based on the Bible confessed by our church is this is the body, this is the blood of Jesus. That with the bread and wine we receive the very body and blood of Jesus in, with, and under the bread and wine for the forgiveness of sins. That is a miracle. There's no other way to explain it. Well, you can't explain it. But that's the way we do explain it. So if somebody asks you about the Lutheran church, how this can be, you know, what's your answer? What do you tell them? I don't know. Beats me. I don't know how this can be. His means is. His means is, the verb to be. But I, I look back at Genesis 1 today, too. How can somebody create something just by speaking a word? Thy strong word did cleave the darkness. At thy speaking it was done. Martin Franzman wrote some great hymns. They, they said that Martin Franzman was the Wisconsin Synod's gift to the Missouri Synod. That's really true, okay? When you look at his hymns and his theology. He wrote some wonderful hymns. But anyway, this, this is a miracle that he fed 5,000 people. Do you not think in the same way you go home from church today and say, what happened to church? We had a miracle. That's what it is. It, it leaves you in awe. So if you're an elder 
And, and you're serving this. And, and I think about this too. I, none of you are worthy, and I'm not worthy to serve it. We are handling the holy things of Christ, which is why even we've changed this communion distribution to continuous, okay? And I'm fine with it, but here's the honest, here's the, you want the honest truth. What do you think about the continuous communion, Pastor? I, I can accept it, and we will keep it reverent, and we'll, it, we'll make it work for the time being, but we're not going to do it forever, if God wills, okay? I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know when. But what I've told people is there's a preference to kneeling before the Lord of receiving the communion, and I'd rather distribute it as you're kneeling. That's, that's kind of the view that I have on that. But I don't have a problem doing this as long as we still keep the awe and the mystery in this, okay? So therefore, when we approach, we still bow our head, we make the sign of the cross, we kneel, we genuflect. We still keep the reverence in whatever manner it's done. So even if you're lying in a hospital bed, and you might be in a hospital bed one day, and I serve you communion, you're still going to re receive it with faith, with belief. That's the important thing, the attitude of the heart. The outward gestures, yes, they express the inner desire of the heart. Right? There was a lady, Marie Beckley. How many of you remember me, Marie Beckley? Good, you got a good memory. So she was a homebound person here years ago in our church. She probably died 10 years ago or so. And I would go to her home, and she insisted on kneeling on the floor to receive the sacrament. And I was a little bit reluctant, you know, I mean, she was this tall, you know, feeble, but I kind of had to help her up, but I realized, she says, no, I've always received communion on my knees in humility. Well, let's keep doing it, okay? And I joke with her, I said, you might die on your knees one day. And she said, wouldn't that be a great way to go? Die on my knees, you know? This is a miracle, but I, I, I want you to keep this in mind if you would think about this and ponder this which is why we should have the reverent attitude toward this too, that every Sunday morning when we have divine service, that ordinary bread and wine up there on the altar right now, when the word is attached to it, that makes it a sacrament, doesn't it? And that's no longer ordinary bread and wine. That is for us the body and the blood of Jesus, eaten and, 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 and drunk to our salvation's benefit with the forgiveness of sins. So, um, this is fascinating when you think about this uh, in, in, the, in this whole miracle here. Did God satisfy? Yes. Are you satisfied when you go to church? Well, I hope and pray you are according to God's will. Now, does that mean, here's the other thing, do we critique the service? Well, yeah, we do a little bit, right? We critique things. You know, this went well, this didn't go well. Okay, That's fine. But my point is, and I tell people this all the time, when you go home, it's not so much a matter of critiquing the pastor in his sermon you can do that. You can discern. You can be analytical. Or even the organist or the ushers or whatever happens, okay? You know, now we got blue tape and all this stuff too, okay? So people are going to, you know, it's just, that's okay. Don't focus on all that stuff, okay? That, that should be peripheral in a certain sense. What did you receive? That's the question, right? Was Christ present was he delivered? Were his gifts given? Did I hear of Jesus Christ and him crucified? Did I receive the forgiveness of my sins? Was the glory put on God, right? Was, the, was God the central focus? And, and so those are the kind of questions, um, okay, were the people friendly to me? Well, I don't know. I guess it all depends who you run into, okay? We got some friendly people here and we got some grumpy people. It's the fact in every church, right? You know, I have a theory about churches. Every church is friendly and unfriendly all at the same time, depending on who you meet, right? Isn't that true? Yeah, it's just personalities. It's fun. You know, pastors, you know, people have views of pastors. The pastor's this, the pastor's that, you know. And I said, well, yeah, every pastor's different. They don't punch us out, you know, in an assembly line. You know, do you know any two pastors alike? No, totally different in a lot of ways. But when you distill it down, you listen to their message, what they're preaching and teaching from the Bible, how they administer the sacraments and their stewardship of this. You look at Jesus and the apostles. They were all very different, but they were delivering the same thing, were they not? They were giving the actions, the deeds, and the teachings. And so God has the, the uh, resources to provide for us. We turn to the Lord. Christ has compassion. And there's an interesting thing about this. The whole context is compassion. For what? Body and soul. Jesus took care of their souls, and he took care of their bodies. And that's really the ministry of the church in a lot of ways. And this is what I kind of felt during this pandemic part of this whole thing, too, that if the church just kind of totally shut down, 
This was not going to be good for people's bodies. And I'm not sure we know the full effect of all this yet, right? How this is all going to shake down when you haven't been able to take care of your body. I mean, were you kind of feeling this too? We all kind of felt this, okay? Um, you've gone through a lot because you've had like two major, well, I mean, one huge disaster. And you, you know, what the effect will be on you and your, your longevity and your health, nobody really knows, right? But it has an effect, right? When your house burns down, your community burns down, that can't unaffect you, right? The, the emotions, the, uh, you, you know, blood pressure, uh, ulcers, right? I mean, heart disease, lung, you know, all these things, right? We don't even know yet, okay? So we pray for you, people affected by that. Um, we don't even know these things, but, you know, when you, when you talk to people, this cumulative effect in life is very interesting, what we go through, and yet Jesus is there with compassion, and that's why, see, you, you and I turn to the church. We turn to the Lord in times of disaster, don't we? You know why? We have nowhere else to turn, right? So it's not a bad thing either, right? So I look back, and I, I, I've, I've said this. If you look at every disaster in life, every pandemic, you say, thank you, Lord, because through this, I wouldn't have chosen it. You were right there, right? You were teaching me. You were leading me. You were guiding me. And in every disaster, it was a chance to repent. And you know what's best for me, right? You know what's best for me. Uh, so for 10 weeks, we, ha we hated this, right? This was detrimental in many ways, but yet God works it for good. And we have to look at that in the scriptures, what Jesus does. He has this compassion upon people. We need to have that same compassion today. God takes care of us, and uh, he takes care of his disciples. And, and so they were fed. There you have the 5,000. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, which, while he sent the multitude away. Now, so you have this interaction where Jesus likes crowds, right? And other times he retreats. Not a bad thing for a Christian to look at this too. There's times you like to go to church and be around your fellow Christians. There's times you just want to get away from them and have a little retreat, right? I'm just thinking about this. These cycles of life. It's not all bad. You know what? Um, you know, so if you live alone, you have, uh, you have some advantages that people who don't live alone have, right? But you also have some disadvantages, Right? And so you look at this and you look at these cycles of, of Christianity in our lives where we want to be with people, we want to be with the crowds, we want to be there with Jesus. There's a, there's a time for that, to be sure. But there's other times when you depart. Now, look what Jesus did. He sends the multitude away. That, I think, this is interesting, but honestly, the crowds drove Jesus nuts sometimes, right? Okay. So I always tell people this. If your pastor just wants to take off and go to the mountains and go fishing for once in a while, he kind of needs that, right, for his own sanity, okay? And maybe you need a break from him, too. My, my whole point is this. There's times for separation solitude in our Christian lives, right? The Lord did this, and it can be a tremendous blessing. What he did was he went away, and he departed to a mountain to pray. So what Jesus did when he isolated himself, one of the chief things he did was engage in prayer. And he often went to mountains. And why the mountains? Well, because the mountain was the place of retreat, okay? The place of prominence. God did some of his best work on mountains, didn't he? Mount Sinai, Mount Calvary, right? These, these were places where Jesus could simply get away. I also think about this, too. If he went to the mountain, he would be able to survey the, the land underneath him and look at it. And you ponder that, right? And you think about the world and the vastness of it, too. And you look at that and go, look at this world, God, right? So when you see all these people out there, you ever flown in an airplane, you look down and go, wow, that's amazing, right? All those little lights, those are all people down there. That, that, those are realities. And we kind of lose that perspective on, on the world. So he does that, and uh, he goes to the mountain to pray. The evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Now, again, these boats are indicative of fishermen, because they continued in their fishing trade. He saw them straining and rowing, and for the wind was against them, about the fourth watch of the night. Okay? So, uh, he's, he's, this fourth watch is from 3 to 6 a.m., right? because he had these three-hour watches. Uh, they were fighting the winds. And now Jesus comes to them, walking on the sea. Miracle? Yes. And would have passed by them, and when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. 
So at any rate, he comes to them. Now again, he's tying this into creation. Lake, wind, water. See, God's always in the midst of creation. So where is God in the middle of SARS-CoV-2? God's right in the middle of that, right? Because that little virus, it's a very beautiful little bug. Have you seen the pictures of it? Electron microscope. It has little protein spikes on it. It's very fascinating. I mean, who designed that? God did, right? Isn't God the creator of all things? Who made the virus? Say it. God made it. Okay. <laughs> Who made bacteria? Say it. God made it, right? Okay. God made all things in this world. It's because you, you can understand this theologically, okay? And that's why I talked about Dr. Francis Collins, who's the director of the National, National Institutes of Health, okay? Dr. Fauci's not the director of the NIH. Dr. Fauci is the director of infectious diseases and immunology, okay? So he's got a different category, but he's been very prominent. But Dr. Francis Collins, did any of you look at the YouTubes and follow him a little bit? He's the interesting guy. He doesn't get a lot of press. It's all Dr. Fauci. You haven't even heard Dr. Fauci? Seen him? He's like a celebrity in a lot of ways, okay? But if you look at Dr. Francis Collins, he's a Christian, devout Christian. He's the, the, the director of the, and I put this up last week, not yet. NIH, he's the director of NIH, which is the National Institutes of Health. So when you look at this, you have to have a theological framework on all these things. Now, does God will that people get sick? No. In fact, Jesus undoes all this, doesn't he? Does God will that people die? No. You go into the fall and read into Genesis, the fall into sin changed everything. So as a Christian, you begin to realize that disease, uh, sickness, death is not part of God's creation. It's an intrusion, correct? And so everything that God created good had a place, but because of sin, now it doesn't work right. Or there's manifestations of, of original sin. So you read Romans 5, how sin came into the world. This is why it's very important to get the doctrine of original sin correct. Otherwise, you won't get anything else correct. Okay? Why do people riot and loot and steal and destroy? Because they're sinners, and that's what sinners do. Okay? All right? You know, and you go down the list, do this whole thing. Okay, that's what sinners do. Sinners murder other people. They do things that are wrong. That's you and that's me, okay? And, and we have to understand this whole thing, of what Scripture teaches about it. But when Jesus comes, this whole creation thing, he's right in the midst of it. He says, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. So what was permeating them was fear, okay? Um... It's just a fascinating thing to, to ponder this, that Jesus is in the middle of this. They actually thought he was a ghost, 4950, phantasma, phantasm, okay? Uh, that, that's how bad this was, and they just thought it was a ghost, but he comes to them with cheer, meaning, he, and by the way, Jesus always does this, doesn't he? His disciples are afraid, where are they? Hiding behind doors, afraid of the, the circumstances. You and I are afraid, aren't we? We have worry, you have anxiety, Right? This is the truth, right? We don't know what the future is going to hold, right? You have anxieties, don't you? Who's going to take care of you when you get old, right? I don't know how we're going to make it. You, you, the list goes on and on and on, okay? That type of thing. So, um, and you think about that, and the Lord comes and brings cheer. So he did this behind the closed doors. What did he say? Peace be with you. And he bestowed the Holy Spirit, right? So Jesus is always coming to people who are afraid and demonstrating his power and authority over these things. Then he went into the boat to them, and the wind ceased. So you can look at this, too, that he used the power of the wind to teach them a lesson. They were amazed themselves, but they had not understood about the loaves because their hearts were hard. Now, what's that all about? What's that all about? Well, he displayed his power over nature in the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. He also just displayed his power over creation by settling the wind. But it says that they didn't understand some things here. They had a lot, lack of comprehension. And what was that that they didn't understand about what? The loaves and the fish. I don't think they understood his deity, his power over creation, right? 
the miraculous nature of God, O ye of little faith, right? And, and that's really the lesson. Their heart was hardened. And again, that's the lesson for us. Our hearts are hardened. We don't understand. We don't comprehend all these things. Why? Because while God is teaching us certain things, our instincts, our sin, goes against it, doesn't it? It doesn't want to agree with it. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit to teach us. Do you have any questions about this? Because, well, I have New King James says, because their heart was hardened. Um, yeah. And, and so you have this hardness of heart, which teaches you about the, the basic sinful nature in man. So it's like Pharaoh, when God did these plagues. Okay, you want to, by the way, that's a great movie, too, all the plagues. You know, it's kind of like pandemics and all this stuff, you know, frogs and gnats and all this stuff. It says Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Well, did God harden his heart? Well, it says in Exodus, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Well, how did God do that? By teaching him, and, and he hardened down. You see? So when God teaches us today, our hearts can harden down as well. It's not that God does it, but it's a, it's a consequence of that. I want to look at this in verse 52 in the Greek, but it, it kind of explains it a little better. For they did not understand um, with their mind concerning the loaves, but it was because their cardia, which is the heart, was uh, having been hardened. So... What would you think if you went to a potluck and they had five loaves and two fish and they fed 5,000 people? Would your heart get hardened? Well, I don't really think that happened. I think they snuck some in the back room. You know what I mean? Well, okay, this morning. All right, so Lord's Supper. I'll just give you a quick here. Okay, so, and there's a lot of Christians that don't believe this. You know that, right? How many of you have evangelicals in your family? Baptists. Okay, I don't have to tell you this, okay? Um, yeah, you know, but it, how, that just can't be, right? See, it's like a hardness of heart that does not want to accept what the Scripture says about these things. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that those people I alluded to are not Christians. I'm not saying that at all, okay? But it does indicate a hardness of heart and how when God teaches us in his word these things, we can then resist it and, and become dubious of it, Right? So when Jesus is on the water, what was their explanation? Yeah, they're hallucinating, right? So we always got some smart answer, don't we, to the things of God, right? That's kind of it, right, Anita? Hardness of heart. So, you know, we pray that our hearts would not be hardened. We would receive the word, the implanted word. We would believe the body and blood of Jesus given and shed for us, right? Okay? The hardness of heart, that's just a man up there in the pulpit. Why listen to him? Yeah, whatever it is, right? Yeah. Good question. All right, that's it. So we'll close with prayer and send it on to YouTube.